All right, everyone, let's dive into these 2024 talent trends. It's late September, which means planning for 2025 is already happening. And whether you're sprucing up your resume or building a team, you have to understand the talent landscape. And we're going straight to the source for this deep dive. It's the 2024 Talent Trends Report from SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management. Yeah, they surveyed over 2,300 HR pros for this report. So we're talking about real insights from the front lines, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Love that. Straight from the source. Yeah. So what's the big story? What's the headline here? Remember the great resignation? That hiring frenzy back then felt like a fever dream. Oh, yeah, I did. It felt like every single company was just desperate for talent, trying to hire anyone and everyone. Well, there's good news. The sense of panic seems to be easing up a bit. You know, back in 2022, 91% of organizations reported that they were struggling to recruit. 91%. Yep, 91%. This year, it's down to 77%. So it's still a lot, but a significant drop. Okay, so not quite time to break out the champagne, but that is a glimmer of hope for sure. What's behind that shift? Did everyone just magically become amazing at recruiting all of a sudden? I wish. No, it's a bit more nuanced than that. Remember how some roles were almost impossible to fill during the pandemic, like a think hourly service jobs, for instance? Yeah, it seemed like every restaurant and every store you walked past had one of those now hiring signs up. Right. Well, those positions have actually become a bit easier to fill now. But then you have these other fields where the pressure is still on. Think high-skill medical roles, skilled trades. No matter what's happening with the economy, those needs are always going to be there. Yeah, makes sense. You can't exactly put healthcare or plumbing on hold just because the market is fluctuating. So we've got some roles where recruiting has calmed down and others where it's still a battle royale. Mm. That's interesting and all. But what does it mean for the average person listening who is just trying to make sense of their career or their company's strategy? It's all about understanding the dynamics of your specific field. If you're in one of those high demand areas, you need to know that the competition is fierce and use that knowledge to your advantage. But even if things have cooled down in your field, understanding these broader trends will give you an edge. So context is everything. Recruiting isn't quite the nightmare it was, but it's not all sunshine and roses either. So what's keeping HR up at night these days? Well, how about a little role reversal for you? Remember all that talk about companies ghosting candidates? Oh, yeah, that was a whole thing for a while. Well, now the tables have turned. 46% of organizations say they're seeing an increase in candidate ghosting. That's almost half. Wow. Talk about a plot twist. So instead of employers leaving candidates hanging, it's the other way around. What's driving that? Is it a power shift? It's a sign of a changing dynamic for sure. Think about it. Some of those pandemic era factors that might have made job seekers more hesitant, like childcare challenges or health concerns, well, those have lessened for a lot of people. So now we're seeing more classic economic drivers come back into play. Competition is heating up and candidates know they have options. So it's less about, can I even find a job that fits with my new life? And more about, am I even getting paid what I'm worth? Are there better offers out there? That old chestnut. Exactly. And that leads us into another big takeaway from this report, the skills gap. We've been talking about this one for a while now, but this report shows it's not going away anytime soon. 25% of organizations said that new hires this past year needed skills that weren't previously required for those same roles. Okay, hold on. Let's unpack that a little. Skills gap. It's a buzzword that gets thrown around a lot. Mm. But what does it actually mean? Are we just talking about coding and AI? Tech is definitely a factor, but it's much bigger than that. The top two reasons given for this whole evolving skill thing are organizational growth and changing customer expectations. Basically, companies are leveling up, customers are getting more demanding, and that raises the bar for everyone. So it's like this perfect storm. Companies are growing, customers are getting more and more picky, and suddenly the skills you had yesterday just don't cut it anymore. Mm. No wonder everyone's scrambling for talent. Exactly. And while it might seem like things like AI and cybersecurity are in high demand, and they are, even basic tech skills are super valuable right now. But here's the thing. Soft skills are also hugely important. Communication, teamwork, problem solving, those came up again and again. Which makes sense. Those human skills never go out of style. You got it. Uh. But it does make you wonder, are your skills keeping pace? What can you do to stay competitive in this crazy job market? That's a great question. So we've established that the skills gap is real, and it's not just about tech. So how are companies trying to attract and retain talent? Are we still seeing those crazy perks 
from the peak Great Resignation days, like free Peloton bikes and unlimited vacation. Wow, this is where things get interesting. Some of those flashy perks are starting to fade away. And the things that have declined the most are, ironically, what employees say they want the most. Okay, now you have to explain that one. What are we talking about? Flexibility and compensation. While offering flexible work arrangements are still important, companies are using them less as a recruiting tactic. And those compensation increases, those have slowed down too. Hold on. Are you saying that companies are pulling back on flexibility and fair pay, the things their employees actually want? What's the logic there? It's a great question. It makes you wonder if there's a disconnect between what companies think will attract top talent and what people actually care about long term. It's possible some companies are making short term decisions to save a buck instead of trying to create a workplace that's both sustainable and attractive to talent. It does feel like they're playing a dangerous game. Can you really afford to not prioritize what your employees value most in this market? It's definitely a risk, and it begs the question, what message are you sending to employees, both current and potential, about what you value? So if you were calling the shots, knowing what we know, what would your top recruiting priorities be? I'd be shouting from the rooftops about flexibility and competitive pay, for starters. But it's more than just ticking those boxes. You have to create a culture that really supports work-life balance. And your approach to compensation needs to be transparent and fair. That's what makes a real difference. It's like the old saying, sometimes the most effective solutions aren't the flashiest. It's about going back to basics, back to the fundamentals that people really care about. And speaking of fundamentals, we hear a lot about apprenticeships, returnships, mentorship, all those talent development programs. But are companies actually using them? That's where the data gets really interesting. Internships are pretty common. About 70% of organizations use them. But the rates for the other programs are way lower than you might think. Really? Give us the numbers. What are we looking at here? Only 21% of organizations have apprenticeship programs in place. And returnships? Even lower, only 9%. Wow. That is shockingly low, especially with all the hype around those programs. So what's the disconnect? Are they just not as effective as everyone says they are? Well, that's just it. They are effective. Organizations that use these programs rave about them. They give them really high marks for addressing talent shortages, building a good workforce, even improving retention. So they work. So why aren't companies using them? What am I missing? I think the biggest hurdle is cost, especially for smaller companies. Setting up a structured program, especially something like an apprenticeship, it takes time, resources, often upfront investment. And that's something that not every company can handle. It's easy to say invest in the future when you're a huge company with money to burn. But when you're a small business just trying to scrape by, those long-term bets are way harder to make. For sure. And then on top of the money, there's also how complex these programs can be. It's not like you just bring someone on and hope for the best. It takes organization planning, which can be a lot, especially for teams that are already swamped. You have to create a curriculum, pair people with mentors. Sometimes there's even regulatory requirements depending on where you are and what industry you're in. So it's not just about having the money. It's about having the people and the time to build this whole new talent pipeline. Right. And even if a company sees the value and has the capacity for it, there's still the question of ROI. How do you measure that? It's hard to draw a direct line from, say, a returnship program to profits, you know, at least not immediately. And we live in a world where everyone wants to see immediate results. Exactly. But here's the thing. Those organizations that actually use these programs, they're seeing the value. They report that it's an effective way to address talent shortages, build a skilled workforce, and it even helps with employee retention. It's about playing the long game, as they say. Exactly. And that's where I think companies have a real opportunity to change the way they think. Maybe you think apprenticeships are just for the trades. But what about tech, healthcare, even creative fields could benefit from a model like that? And returnships. Think about all the talented people out there who had to step away from their careers. Maybe they were caring for family, traveling, whatever it was. But now when they try to come back, they run into all these roadblocks. It's like we're just wasting all this potential by clinging to these outdated ideas of what a career path should look like. I couldn't agree more. And don't forget about mentorship. You don't always need some big, fancy program to make an impact. Mentorship, whether it's formal or not, consistently gets great reviews as a way to address talent shortages and build a skilled workforce. It's about recognizing that experience has value and building a culture where people share knowledge and everyone has the chance to learn and grow. Exactly. And since we're on the topic of shaking things up and challenging old ways of thinking, we have to talk about remote work. Ah, uh, yes. 
the elephant in the Zoom room. Can't really talk about the future of work without it these days, can we? Nope. And while this SHRM report doesn't focus entirely on remote work, it does highlight how this huge shift is changing everything. I'm talking recruitment, retention, even what employees expect from their employers. We mentioned earlier how companies are moving away from offering flexible work arrangements as a recruiting tactic, even though employees love them. It seems a little backwards, to say the least. It's definitely one of those head-scratching trends. But here's the thing. When everyone offers remote work, it's not really a perk anymore, is it? It's more like, well, yeah, that's just what you do now, especially in certain roles and industries. So it's less of a look what we offer and more of a, well, obviously we offer that. Exactly. And that puts pressure on companies to adapt. Just offering remote work as an option isn't enough anymore. They need to have a plan for how they manage these remote teams, how they create a company culture when everyone's working from different places, how they make sure remote workers feel just as included and supported and valued as the people in the office. It's a whole new world, isn't it? Yeah. New opportunities, new challenges. You said it. And it's not even just about where you get the work done, but how you do it. We're seeing a bigger focus on results. Did you get the work done? Great. It's less about being chained to your desk from nine to five. Which makes sense. At the end of the day, it's about the work, not when or where you did it. But that requires a lot of trust, doesn't it? And companies might need to rethink how they view work. They do. They need to rethink performance reviews, communication, even how they measure productivity. It's amazing how one thing, this whole remote work thing, has had such a huge impact. It really shows you how these trends are all connected. And for everyone listening, whether you're looking for a job, managing a team, or just trying to keep up, you have to stay informed about how these trends are playing out in your own little corner of the world. It's not just about knowing what's going on. It's about understanding what it means for you and how you can adapt to not just survive, but really thrive in this new world of work. Okay, so we've got all these different things happening. The great resignation is kind of sort of over for some jobs, but not others. People are ghosting employers left and right. Companies are pulling back on flexibility and pay, even though that's what everyone says they want. And these talent development programs that everyone seems to love aren't being used. It's a lot to process. It really shows you how important it is for companies to think strategically, maybe take a few risks when it comes to finding and keeping good people. It's tempting to go for the quick fix or assume you know what everyone wants, but the data tells a different story. And speaking of the data telling a different story, let's go back to those talent development programs for a second. I get that they're not widely used, but I still don't get why. If they're so great, what's stopping companies from using them? It's complicated. There isn't one simple answer, but this SHRM report does give us a few clues. Cost is a biggie, obviously, especially for the little guys. I mean, think about it. Setting up an apprenticeship program, that's time, resources, upfront costs that some companies just can't swing. Yeah. When you're a huge corporation with tons of money, invest in the future. Sounds great. But it's different when you're a small business owner just trying to make ends meet. Those long-term investments, yeah, not so easy. Exactly. And it's not just about the money either. These programs, they're not exactly plug and play. It takes a lot of effort behind the scenes to make them work. And a lot of teams are already stretched thin. I'm talking curriculum development, mentor matching, depending on the field and where you are, there might even be legal hoops to jump through. It's a lot. So you need the money. Sure. But you also need the people and the time to build this whole system from scratch. Right. And even if a company buys into all this, even if they have the resources, you still have the ROI question. How do you measure that? It's not like you can draw a straight line from a returnship program to like how much profit you make. Not right away, at least. It's that instant gratification thing. Everyone wants to see results like yesterday. It's true. But the thing is, the companies that actually use these programs... They love them. They say they're a great way to close the skills gap, build a strong team, even keep their employees from leaving. See, long game. Sometimes the best things take time. 100%. And this is where I think companies really need to think outside the box. I mean, everyone thinks apprenticeships are just for the trades, right? But why not tech? Why not healthcare? Even creative fields could use a system like that. And returnships. Think of all those people who left their jobs for one reason or another. Maybe they were taking care of their kids. Maybe they were traveling. And now they hit a wall when they try to come back. It's like we're ignoring all this amazing talent because we're stuck in the past. Yeah. Career paths don't have to look like they used to. Exactly. And let's not forget about mentoring. You don't always need a huge program to make a difference. Whether it's official or not, 
men turning is consistently rated as a highly effective way to fill those skill gaps and create a strong, capable workforce. It's about acknowledging that experience is valuable, you know, mm. and creating a culture where people share what they know and everyone has the chance to learn and move up. You got it. And since mm. we're already talking about new ways of doing things and challenging the status quo, we have to talk about remote work. Oh, here we go. Mm. Remote work. The elephant in the Zoom, as they say. How can we talk about the future of work without talking about that? We can't. This SHRM report doesn't focus only on remote work, but it does talk about how this huge shift is changing everything. How we recruit, how we keep employees, what people want from their jobs. We talked before about how companies are actually moving away from offering flexible work arrangements, even though their people love them. Seems counterproductive. Right. It's one of those things that makes you go, hmm. But think about it. If everyone offers remote work, it's not really a perk anymore, is it? It's just the bare minimum, especially for some jobs and industries. So it's less of a look what we have that other companies don't and more of a, yeah, duh, we offer that. Everyone does. Right. And that means companies need to adapt. It's not enough to just let people work remotely anymore. Now they need a plan. How do we manage all these remote workers? How do we create a company culture when everyone's all over the place? How do we make sure the people at home feel just as included and appreciated as the people in the office? New world, new problems. Pretty much. And it's not even just about where you're working from, but how you're working. There's more focus now on results. Did you get the work done? Awesome. Nobody cares if you were chained to your desk from 9 to 5. It just makes sense. Yeah. It's about the work, not about punching a clock. But that requires trust, doesn't it? Yeah. And I'm not sure all companies are there yet. Trust is huge. Companies might need to rethink their whole approach to performance reviews, how they communicate, even how they measure if people are being productive. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? This one thing, this whole remote work thing, has had such a huge ripple effect. It really shows how connected everything is these days. And for everyone listening, no matter where you are in your career, you need to know what's going on in your little corner of the world. You have to stay informed. It's not enough to just know what's happening. You have to understand what it means for you, how you can adapt, how you can not just keep your head above water, but actually thrive in this new world of work. Wow, we covered so much ground here. Candidate ghosting, apprenticeships, remote work. My brain is full. It's a lot, I know, but that's how it is these days. The talent world never sits still. Right. And the more you know, the better prepared you are. You got that right. So as we wrap up, what are the big takeaways? What do you really want our listeners to remember from this deep dive? We talk about a lot of different things, but to me, the biggest thing is you have to be able to adapt. Like, if you're just starting out in your career, you got to keep learning new stuff, be ready to try new ways of working, yeah. and companies. you got to be willing to try new things and be okay with change because the old ways, they don't always work anymore. So true. The old playbook is out the window. Exactly. And that brings us back to the skills gap, right? Knowing it exists and actually doing something about it, two different things. Totally. It can feel overwhelming. So for all our listeners out there thinking, Skills gap, skills gap, what am I supposed to do? What's step one? Where do they start? I always say it starts in your head. And instead of thinking, okay, here are all the things I'm good at. Here are my skills. You have to ask yourself, what are the skills I need? What do I need to learn? And you have to keep asking yourself that throughout your career. That whole lifelong learner thing, right? Yep. And it's not just about going back to school. You can learn so much on the job through mentors, online courses, go to conferences, you know, put yourself out there, get exposed to new ideas. Be curious. Be a sponge. You don't need anyone to hold your hand. You can create your own path. Yes. Love that. And if you're running a company, create a culture of learning. Give your people the chance to grow, to learn new stuff. Encourage them to experiment. Share their knowledge. When you invest in your people, everyone wins. It's about the future. Yeah. It's not just about filling those empty desks today. It's about having the right people with the right skills ready to tackle whatever comes next. Couldn't have said it better myself. And that actually brings me to my final point, which is you have to be careful with all this data that's out there these days. We've been talking about this SHRM report, which is full of great information. But it's true. Everyone's throwing data at you these days. It's overwhelming. How do you know it's real? How do you cut through the noise? Right. Just because someone slaps a statistic on something doesn't mean it's true or objective or even relevant to you, right? Buyer beware. Exactly. Anytime you see a headline about the future of work or the job market or whatever, you got to ask yourself some questions. Where is this information coming from? Who's the messenger? What are they trying to sell me? And most importantly, does it even apply to me, to my job, to my company? 
Don't just accept something because it has a fancy chart next to it. Data should help you make decisions, not make them for you. That's it. Bring your own experience to the table. Trust your gut, your values. So, listeners, next time you see one of those articles, you know, the 10 jobs of the future, don't just take it at face value. Do your own research. Think for yourself. Figure out what it means for you. And the future of work. We're all creating that together. Such a great point. This has been amazing. We talked about all the ups and downs of the 2024 talent landscape, uncovered some really interesting stuff, hopefully gave our listeners a lot to think about. Love being here. Always a good time. And to our wonderful listeners, thank you for joining us on The Deep Dive. We'll be back next time with another topic, more insights, more exploring. Until then, keep learning, keep growing, and keep diving deep.